My name is Shannon Gallo. I'm the manager of career services here at the CUNY School of Professional Studies. I would like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Um, I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk with all of you about fixing up your resumes and working on your job search toolkit in preparation for your career search. Um, I'm happy that the director of your program, Ellen Carl, is also able to join us this evening. And Ellen was going to take a couple of minutes and just welcome all of you. Ellen? Hi, everybody. Glad to see some very familiar names in our um, in the name in the attendee list. Uh, we also have Janet Molenhoff and Donna Samia joining us tonight. So the whole the gang is all here. And I'm hoping that you will be able to glean some information from Shannon's presentation tonight about fixing up that resume. Um, so as you go off to interview for either the apprenticeship spots or for um, your first job in coding that your resume will be tuned up and ready to go when you're ready to go. Thank you, Ellen. I'm going to go through um, some tips and pointers. Most of my remarks will focus on resumes this evening. And then if we have time, depending on how the questions are coming in, we'll talk about some of those other things that are part of your job search toolkit part of your whole package on paper um, or online. Um, so without any further ado, I'll go ahead and move into resume tips. Um, there's two typical formats of resumes. Um, the most common of those is the reverse chronological resume, which is your typical resume, which has experience listed in order from your current or most recent employment to your least recent employment. And this type of resume is focused on job titles and the organizations in which you've worked. Um, it highlights a progression of your career if you've been with certain employers for more lengthy amounts of time. Um, and it talks a lot and highlights your most recent accomplishments. Another type of resume that is um, fairly popular is the functional format. And this type of resume is more focused on your skill sets. And it's something that can be useful for someone who is looking to change careers and wants to highlight some of those transferable skills and really sort of highlight the skill sets and competencies and achievements, even if those might have um, occurred in a different field or a different type of job. So that's another type of resume that we'll see. Um, my focus will be more on the traditional reverse chronological format. Um, but I did want to mention that there's another type of resume that is um, sometimes used. So when you get started with your resume, some of you may already have a resume, sort of a working document that you have used previously. Um, and if that's the case, you may find that if it's in a template, that you would have a lot of difficulty making changes to the resume. So what is typically recommended if you are going to make fairly extensive changes to your resume that you get started from scratch. Um, open up MS Word and get the content and the text in there and then go through on your own and make changes to the fonts and so forth to make the document more visually appealing once you have all the content set. Um, some quick pointers on the fonts, typically between 10 and 12 point is the right size. Um, and make sure that that's consistent throughout the document. So if you decide you're going to use Arial in your document and you're going to use 11 point, you wanna do that throughout the document. You can also um, use things like bold and you can italicize certain pieces of your resume to show emphasis or underline. Um, but the key important thing to do is make sure that is consistent throughout the document. Um, again, the word consistency comes up. Make sure that your margins are even throughout the document so that if you look from top to bottom and you have your job titles aligned and the names of your employers aligned, and then if you tab over with um, bulleted job descriptions, you want to make sure that all of those things are aligned and that everything is consistent. If you use bold to create your subheadings, 
use bold for all of your subheadings. If you underline job titles, underline all of the job titles. It's not recommended to use graphics on a resume, um, particularly if you're in a field that is not related to communications or digital media. It's more important to have a consistent clean document as opposed to adding a lot of bells and whistles and graphics. Um, another thing to keep off the resume is a photo. Um, you certainly can use social media for professional networking purposes, and you would certainly want to have a photo on that, but not on the resume itself. Um, and lastly, bullets keep the resume very neat and easy to read quickly. I will be showing an example of a resume toward the end of the presentation, and I think that that could be helpful to some of you to sort of see all of these pointers in action. So let's talk a little bit about the content of the resume. Um, and a big important part of that is um, truly how you use verbs to describe your accomplishments and your responsibilities in the jobs that you've had. You want to make sure that you're using descriptive terminology, but you don't want to overdo it. You want to make sure that you're honest, but you want to speak positively about yourself. Because after all, if you can't be um, positive and really talk yourself up, then how are you going to be able to do that with an employer? So a couple of other things about verbs. Make sure that your current job uses present tense verbs and your previous jobs use past tense verbs. And again, this should be consistent throughout the document. Make sure that each bullet begins with the strongest action verb and try to avoid repeating words or phrases, especially if it's one bullet after the next. Um, providing variety in the resume makes it more memorable for a recruiter who, who may likely be reading the resume in one minute, two minute, and you wanna make sure that it's as memorable as possible. And that's another reason why you wanna make sure that it's very consistent and clean. So a couple of other things about the content and what you're choosing. Um, resumes can be very difficult because you want to make sure that the document is descriptive about the work experience that you have and the responsibilities that you've held in your jobs, but you also want to make sure that it's results oriented and it's really how you're sort of showing off to the employer how you've made an impact in your work. And this is something that can be done even if you haven't had high level positions or if you have work experiences that you might not necessarily think are extremely relatable for that particular job. Anytime you can add numbers or percentages or any sort of quantifying details, that really adds a lot to making the document more favorable. Again, as far as achievements and results, another important thing to keep in mind is that your resume is truly your opportunity to really sell yourself. So you want to be careful to not just repeat a job description. Many times in the work that we do, we have responsibilities that are outside of our job description. And sometimes those can be the most crucial details to include on your resume. So make sure that you do so. Even if it's something that you sort of have done from the very beginning of your job, but it's not part of your job description and you think it's making a big impact in your employers for your employer, make sure that that's included on your resume. Even if your job title doesn't indicate something, make sure that that's included on your resume. Shannon? Yes, hi. Can we, hi, we have a question. Okay. Um, if, the question is, if I have a cover letter, do I still need to have the objectives on my resume? Okay, good question. I think in most, in most cases, um, on a resume, an objective um, is a little bit outdated. Um, sometimes what can work better on a resume than an objective is to create more of a summary or a sort of a pitch in describing your experience, your education, and what you're looking for. So including a bit of an objective, but also including some descriptive characteristics so that if a person is reading your resume outside of reading your cover letter, 
they still will get an idea of what you're looking for, but it's not sort of a simple objective that doesn't really do much to add to your resume. Um, the other piece about the cover letter is that your cover letters should be more specific and targeted to that particular job and department and organization. And it's very difficult um, to really put too much detail on your resume. So you likely still need a cover letter if you're sending a resume. So it's better to use the cover letter and be specific than to just include an objective and avoid being specific in the cover letter. I understand that's a little bit confusing, but that's typically what I would recommend. Thank you. Any other questions to pause for now? Okay. Nope, not yet. Okay, thank you. Um, so just a couple other things, as I was mentioning, um, using a summary on the resume can be very helpful um, to sort of provide an overview of your qualifications, but also describe what you're looking for. Um, another thing I'd like to mention when I'm talking about resumes is buzzwords and making sure that you are using industry specific terminology and taking cues from job postings. Um, and this is a big one. I always mention be careful with acronyms and it's something that I see um, on occasion from individuals looking to work in medical billing, medical coding, health information management, things like HIPAA. Be very, very careful that you are putting that correctly on your resume because Many times people will say H-I-P-P-A, and um, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So be very careful with those kinds of things. And if you're not certain about an acronym or an abbreviation, or if it's something that may not be um, sort of familiar outside of one specific organization, you may want to actually write it out so that someone who's reading the resume outside of the organization will understand what it is. Your education. Um, a question that we get a lot is, should I put my high school on my resume? Should I include my certificates? And this is something that I think is very individual. Um, of course, if you have a certificate that you're earning right now, <laughs> which all of you should be, um, that's something that you absolutely want to include on your resume. If you have other certifications that may or may not be related to your field, you could certainly include those as well particularly if it seems like your resume um, is a little bit light on content, you can certainly include certificates. Um, your GPA can also be included. Typically, if it's 3.5 or higher, I would say to include the GPA. Um, and then another final thought, sort of just a couple of final thoughts with the overall impression of your resume. And these are some pointers. Um, I worked in recruiting a couple, um, well, I guess it's been eight or nine years ago now, but one of the things that we used to do is um, when we would re receive a resume, we would read it from the bottom to the top. And part of the reason we would do that is to see if there was a progression in the person's experience, in their education, in the types of things that were mentioned in the document. So if you're using that reverse chronological format, the most recent and higher level things would be on the top part of the resume and the least recent and more entry level things might be on the bottom of the resume. So when you're putting your own resume together, sometimes it can be useful to read it from the bottom of the top, from the bottom to the top. The other thing is that if you read it out loud, that makes a big difference as well. Sometimes a uh, spell check won't pick up something that is an error or there might be some word choices that sound a little awkward. And if you read it out loud, it allows you to get a feel for what the reader will have in their head when they're reading it silently. And then finally, print out the document for a final review. Sometimes if you just print it out and you have a hard copy in front of you, it gives you a better idea of what the document looks like visually. Um, and that can make a big difference in the overall impression of your resume. Are there any other questions coming through? 
Not yet. Okay. So. Oh, wait. We just got a question. Great. Hang on. Um, how do you handle past experiences from multiple careers that span over 20 years? Okay. Great question. Um, that I would um, go back to the functional resume that I had mentioned. Um, one way that I think a functional resume can be useful is if you have a lot of different types of experiences that, you know, maybe if looked at outside of the health field may not necessarily feel related um, to an employer, but if you put them into a functional format and you set them into categories of transferable skills, um, that can sort of be a way to describe it. You would still list the organizations where you work, the job titles that you held, and the time periods that you held those jobs, but that would be more toward the bottom of the document, and the top of the document would be highlighting transferable skill sets. Um, this is something that I would encourage I would encourage the individual who asked this question or any of the others here to reach out to us so we can you know sort of talk with you more individually about your resume. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with those experiences that a lot of times if you get um, some training and some relevant um, certifications coming through, that can really make a big difference with, being able to sort of give credibility to yourself and saying, look, I have all these skill sets. I have everything outlined on my resume about how they transfer into this field. And now I have my certificate and that can really sort of add to your credibility. So, you know, I could go on and on about sort of making that career transition, but I think one of the big things that can be helpful is that functional resume. Anything else? Not yet. Okay. So I included a couple of um, sort of myths. These are sort of things that um, we hear. And I thought um, it might be helpful to go over a couple of these. Um, I talked a little bit about objectives when I answered the question earlier. Um, another question, how far back do you go? And, you know, this, again, is very dependent on the individual. But if you think about it in terms of what's relevant, um, if you worked 20 years ago in a healthcare setting and then you left that field and worked for 15 years in an unrelated field and then now you're trying to go back to healthcare then you may want to include the experience that you have from all those years ago so that they understand you do have some exposure. However, you may not want to have all of the details and descriptions and sort of a long drawn out part of your resume with that experience because after so much time has passed, it may not be too relevant to what the position is that you're looking for now. Otherwise, another thing to keep in mind in terms of how far back do you go is what are the other dates on your resume? If you have, if you're including a date for education that you had from many years ago, then you want the dates for your employment to match up. If you are, if you've worked in an organization for many, many years and you only had a couple of years prior to that, then you probably do want to go back all the way through, even if you've worked at an organization for 15 years, because you don't sort of want to cut off your experience in the middle of a place where you were employed. Um, however, I think generally you want to stop, I'd say around 10 to 12 years at most. Um, but again, a lot of it depends on if your experience is, that are more in the distant past than that are more relevant to what you want to do now, you may want to reconsider and actually include. The other thing that you can do is use a cover letter and maybe you only go back eight or 10 years on your resume. Um, but you mention in the cover letter that prior to your 
recent work history, you do have experience working in such and such hospital, and that's why you're interested in moving back into healthcare, something like that. You can sort of use some judgment in what would be most important for the employer to know, but not going back so far that it makes the resume too detailed and um, difficult for an employer to really grasp a lot of the recent accomplishments. Um, what else do I want to touch on here? If there are any other questions on resumes, I will be happy to address them. Otherwise, I'll talk some about some of those other parts of the toolkit, and then we'll talk about the resume. Shannon? Yep. One person is asking about the one-page rule. Okay. I think that's a very similar, uh, that's a similar response to how far back do you go with your experience. Um, a lot of people say no longer than one page, no matter what. But as I've been working at the School of Professional Studies for eight years now, and I meet a lot of students who have lots of work experience and life experience, and it's just simply not possible to get it all on one page. So sometimes it's okay to go to one and a half pages, two pages at absolute most. The important thing again to keep in mind is that if you're getting too long with the resume, you need to make sure that everything that is included is relevant. You need to make sure that you're not repeating things particularly if you've held uh, similar or the same types of jobs in different organizations over the years, you don't need to list similar functions every single time. You can list it one time for one job if it was more prominent in the work that you did, and you can list something else with a different job that was more prominent for that position. So the answer of the question to the question is, it doesn't have to be one page or under. Um, keep it shorter than two pages, but it's okay if it goes past one page. The other thing to keep in mind is that you want it to be logical so that if you have, you know, maybe five or six lines that are going on to the second page, then maybe you look at the document after you have all the content in it and make some changes to the margins. Maybe you make some of, change some of the spacing. Maybe you try and just tweak it here and there a little bit to try and get it onto the one page. But if it's going where you have like 10, 15 lines and it's just getting too crowded on one page, go to two pages. The other pointer, if you are going to two pages, make sure that you indicate page one and page two in case someone does print it out or they're scrolling on their computer to make sure they know there is more than one page and include your name on page one and page two. Other questions on resumes? Not right now. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of details that I could go over about cover letters, but I think the two important things that I wanted to cover here um, and I talked a little earlier about making sure that they're targeted and specific. Um, as I mentioned before, when I worked in recruiting, one of the sort of dead giveaways is when a person would send a cover letter and you could tell that they had basically changed the name of the employer and the name of the job title and nothing else was changed in the cover letter. Uh, conversely, when we would see a cover letter that said, your position requires a person who has experience in QuickBooks, or your position requires someone who is familiar with HIPAA. I have experience following HIPAA from my previous position being very specific and pointing out certain things that they indicated in their job description that you possess. It makes such a big difference when you're making cover letters that they really sort of 
show that you've done your homework and you've taken a few minutes to make it specific for the position. Now, does everyone read cover letters? Probably not. But if you're going to take the time to do a cover letter, it makes sense to make it a good one. The other piece of that, and even though it seems that they can be tedious and they take some time, they also can be helpful down the line because if you do get a call back for an interview, you know that whatever it was that you took the time to talk about in your cover letter is the same kind of thing that you want to practice and prepare to articulate in the interview. Uh, the other thing about cover letters is that it's okay to show them you're enthusiastic about the position and give them an idea of why it is you want to work in that field, why that organization is appealing to you. And even if it's as simple as I live right down the street and I know that um, the, the hospital is very important in our community. Something simple like that can really make a difference and can really sort of set you apart from some other candidate who has comparable experience and education and skills. So take the time to do those things in cover letters. Follow up thank you letters. Um, this is Another one of those things that I think can really make a big difference um, if you have moved on to the process of an interview and you've had the opportunity um, to talk with someone about a position, should you send a follow up letter, letter? Absolutely. Every single time, even if you don't think you would want to work in that organization in 100 years, you still want to make sure that you send some sort of follow up letter to let them know that you're gracious and that you felt you know, honored that they took the time to speak with you. You just never know how circumstances could change or maybe the person has a colleague in another organization that has a job that's a better fit for you. You wanna make sure that you sort of tie up any loose ends and make sure that you leave a nice lasting impression with the person, even if you don't necessarily think you would even want the position. The other piece that can be helpful with follow up and thank you letters is you never know for sure how long an interviewing process will be going on at an organization. And maybe they interview you on Monday afternoon and they continue to conduct interviews for the rest of the week. And then Friday afternoon rolls around and they're making decisions on which candidates they want to speak with for a second interview. If they've received a follow up thank you letter from you on Wednesday morning, they're going to be more likely to have you top of mind than if they hadn't received any follow up. So it's also just a really good way to sort of keep yourself on someone's radar, particularly if they're busy as can be and they're meeting a lot of candidates. Feel free to jump in if there are questions about cover about thank you letters or cover letters or resumes. References sheet. Um, this is something interesting, and I mentioned in the fourth bullet there, provide upon request. Um, many people still put this statement on their resumes, and I typically advise against doing so. I think it's more important to include meaningful content and achievement-oriented information on your resume rather than listing references provided upon request. If an employer wants your reference information, they will ask. Um, the other piece of this is it's it's pretty uncommon for an employer to want to see reference letters or recommendation letters. Um, this may not be true in some fields, but for the most part, an employer is going to actually want contact information for your professional references. So this is why uh, we recommend that you create a separate references page. Um, you use the same heading that you use on your resume and your cover letter. Try to come up with um, three references, possibly four. Um, it can be tough, particularly if you don't have a lot of work experience or you've worked in maybe only one organization, um, that can be difficult. But you can also keep in mind that um, colleagues can be references. Sometimes an instructor could be a reference for you. Um, you know, just keep in mind that it's important to sort of have those people in mind and make sure that they are aware and willing to be a positive reference for you. 
online profiles. LinkedIn, this is one of those things that I could talk about for hours and hours, um, but I won't, I promise. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that I think um, can be really important. Um, LinkedIn is sort of, I would call it um, a, a more extensive representation of yourself than a resume. Um, your LinkedIn profile gives you the ability to include work samples, to include information about courses that you've taken, to post all kinds of details that you wouldn't necessarily want to put on a resume, particularly if you're trying to keep it to one page or one and a half pages. Um, LinkedIn is, you know, I haven't seen the statistic lately, but it used to always be that um, somewhere around 80% of recruiters use LinkedIn to find employees. So, you know, from there, that just tells you that it's really crucial that you at least have a presence on the site. Um, and even if you don't have a lot of information to include on your LinkedIn profile, it still can be helpful to have it in order to maintain relationships with people that you meet within your classes, within, um, within the work environment, even acquaintances and people that you know around your community. Um, you know, everybody loves Instagram and Facebook and others, uh, Twitter, Snapchat, those kinds of things. And I think we spend hours and hours using social media. So I just think there's no reason why we can't incorporate LinkedIn into that as it really is the premier social net, premier professional social network. Um, the other thing about LinkedIn is if it's something you're interested in creating and setting up, there are a ton of training modules available through the site. You just go to learn.linkedin.com and you'll be able to figure out a lot of stuff just from there. Feel free to interrupt me if there's questions coming in. I could talk a little bit about ePortfolios and writing samples in a website. Um, I really want to take an opportunity to show all of you an example resume that I put together um, for this webinar. So let me go. Um, let me talk about applications um, because I do think that this is something that's important that still comes up. So many times um, you might go online to an organization's site and you'll see their job posting website and they have an online application that you complete. You basically you have to set up a profile and log in. Um, many times they'll ask you to upload a resume, but then they'll also ask you to fill out all of the application fields. Um, it's pretty redundant and it's frustrating because it takes a lot of time, but it's typically recommended that um, you know, that you complete any of those fields that they're asking you to complete because many times their systems have a way of searching using that information that's filled out in the application fields rather than from the resume. But that being said, if the application system gives you the option to either upload a resume or copy and paste the resume, I typically recommend uploading the resume as a PDF document. That way you can be certain that no matter what happens in their applicant tracking system, that your resume will stay as is. Um, if you copy and paste your resume into these systems, then you usually have to go back and fix the spacing and fix the formats and it just sort of gets all jumbled up. So I typically recommend uploading your resume as a PDF. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention if you go on an interview and they actually have a paper application. Um, it does still happen occasionally. Um, make sure that you, again, answer all the questions, fill out all the fields. Um, and this is where your resume and the references sheet that I mentioned earlier come in handy because you can really sort of look at your resume and make sure you're getting the pertinent details correct. Same thing with your references sheet because you can transpose the information from your references sheet into the application. And lastly, I mentioned legally binding because um, this 
typically when you fill out an application, if it's paper or even online, once you've completed all of the fields, you have a little section at the bottom where they ask you to certify basically that what you're saying is true. And I have heard from time to time that this can be legally binding. So make sure that you're honest um, when you're filling out the applications and so forth, because you just never know. The other piece of that is salary. Um, it's probably one of the most difficult parts of a job search, but one thing that we have going for us, at least um, if you're in New York, I don't know for sure if anyone is located in New York, but if you are, there's um, recently a city, I guess it's a law or an ordinance that employers in New York are not allowed to ask for salary history and information until an offer is being extended. So that's certainly something that's very helpful, I think, for job seekers um, in the process. But if that's not the case, certainly be honest about salary history if that's something that they require you provide. But if they don't ask for it, don't give it to them. It's something, um, it can be very difficult. There are some other sort of resources that you can use to find out what the typical average salary is for the position and a person with your experience and qualifications. But like I said, unless they ask for it specifically or it's required in the application, I typically would recommend not including it. Okay, so I went over the resume tips. Um, I gave you pointers on the content and your word choice. I talked about making your documents results oriented. And I also went over some of those myths and mysteries. And then I did a quick overview of the other pieces of the whole package that are in your toolkit. Um, so at this point, I hope that you'll send some more questions in. Um, I am going to take a minute and... Uh, show you a sample resume that I put together. Bear with me a second. Okay, so this document. Shannon, I, I do have one question. Okay, um, I'll jump in right here with it. It's uh, the question is: Is the look or template of the resume an important factor? Yes, it, it can be. Um, the, the template piece of it, I think, you know, be careful because if you use a template that's in Microsoft Word, it can be very difficult to make changes or to tweak it at all. Um, so I typically recommend sort of starting from scratch in Microsoft Word. Even if you have an older resume that you want to make more large scale changes to, take that copy it, paste it into a new blank Word document, and clear all the formatting. So at least you have the text, but you can go back through and make things bold and italics and so forth. Um, and yeah, I, I would say that the presentation makes a big difference, um, just in terms of if a recruiter or an employer is reading you know, a pile of resumes in a very short amount of time, you want to make sure that your document is clean, it has consistencies, that it's visually appealing, but not to the extent that it distracts from the content. Um, hopefully that answers the question. I think so. Okay. So here's sort of an example of a resume that I put together in trying to sort of show what a resume might look like to someone in the field. Um, as I had talked about before, there's a summary on this resume. Um, it talks, you know, it describes the person's strengths, their experiences, and it describes some of the knowledge that they've gained recently uh, while taking their courses in coding. Um, so that sort of gives you an idea of what could be in the summary. Um, the education section, as you can see on here, um, it indicates that the certificate is expected to be completed um, June 2018. The person does have a um, 
fairly high GPA, so that's been included. And it also mentions that they'll be planning to take the CCA um, this summer, so that's indicated as well. Many times if an organization says they want um, someone with that CCA, they might be willing to consider someone who has that pending um, because simply because their hiring process may take a while. And in turn, and by the time the person is processed and hired for the position, they may very well have completed the certification. So that's why I always indicate you can include that. It also gets that on the resume as a keyword, um, because if that is a requirement the employer is looking for, they may do a search in their applicant tracking system for CCA. And so your resume would pop up even though your certification is pending. This resume, moving a little further down, sorry about that. So this person um, has a current position. They work at this community caregivers organization as a receptionist. And make note that the information here is in present tense. This is what they do now. They greet clients and notify program staff of arrival. Um, and then their previous position, um, a similar role, is in past tense. And that can make a big difference. And if you look at this resume, as I was saying, everything is consistent. Each category is all caps, bold, and underlined. Each name of employer is bold. Each job title is italicized. So this gives um, the overall look of the document a very clean look, and it makes it very easy for a person who's reading it quickly to see exactly what the important pieces are. The other piece of it is um, on here, they give a little bit of specific details. Instead of saying, um, make phone calls, they say contact clients with appointment reminders and schedule follow-up visits and lab procedures. So that gives a little bit more detail about what they're doing. Now, what would make this resume even stronger is if the person could add some quantifying details. So maybe they make 20 phone calls every day to do appointment reminders and schedule visits. Maybe they could add that. Contact 20 clients daily with appointment reminders. And that way it gives the employer, the prospective employer, an idea of the scope of their work. If they were working in, um, in their previous position, it indicates here that they did some translations because they have um, bilingual skills in English and Spanish. If this was something that they were doing constantly all the time, they may want to rephrase this to indicate that this was a pretty prominent thing that they had done. Um, and then finally, in the skills section at the bottom, I've included information about general computer software skills, but I've also included some specific information related to health information management. We indicated some of these things here so that, again, like with the CCA pending, if an employer is doing a keyword search, these types of things might be what they look for. So if you have them listed specifically on your resume, that can sort of make your resume pop out of a big list of others that don't have these things specifically listed. Are there questions about the resume? Yes, couple of questions. Let's hear it. So first, first question is, someone really likes this resume, so they would like to know if you can share the sample with them. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, good. I will, All right. So, I'll send you the presentation slides and the okay. final resume. Okay, great. Um, the second question is from someone who has a current resume that's printed on a pink piece of paper, and she's wondering um, about colored paper. Uh, should we is col should colored be used, or should we stick with white? I think. Uh, white or ivory, ivory is probably better. Um, again, you want it to stand out, but I think it's just a little bit unusual for someone to see it. Um, it it's also, you know, keep in mind that while it's, I, I think there's probably worse things 
um, than that, but you don't want the person to think of you as the candidate who had a resume on pink paper. You want the employer to think of you as the candidate who was a bilingual communicator that was really sharp on um, HIM and coding fundamentals. So it's, you know, things like that you have to be careful because you want to make sure that you stand out, but for the right reasons.